We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. This is Waterloo. For the British there's probably no greater single battle. It's where Wellington defeated Napoleon. History, in a minor key, has repeated itself. The United Kingdom, almost alone, has again faced a continent seemingly dominated by the will of Germany. The cliché now seems so normal that many forget to ask what really happened after the European elections. Is Europe on a prosperous path or on a road to perdition? Did Germany really dominate the European Council? Is Angela Merkel as powerful as Europe's media like to think? And is David Cameron really losing the war? Wellington, unlike Cameron, had already prepared his allies. And when he went to the battlefield, he went with support behind him. On one side of the battlefield was Angela Merkel, and on the other, David Cameron. Cameron didn't need to overwhelm Merkel's forces. He just needed a blocking minority. Waterloo is still important in modern European politics because Wellington's victory is so deeply rooted in Britain's psychology that it is considered better to pursue a noble aim and to fail than to run from the fight. I firmly believe in the principle that the European Council should be the one to propose the candidate. And if you believe in a principle, you should stand up for it. That is why I stood firm in my opposition today. A viral form of drunkenness has swept Europe's capital cities. Prime ministers and presidents from Portugal to Poland heard that the bar was open and one's country would pick up the tab for any damage done. A little intoxicated with self-preservation, principles were traded for another bottle of rhetoric, a six-pack of headlines and the noisy singing in the streets with new friends on the way home. It could have been any European summit, but this time it was personal. This time, there was a fight inside the club and the door staff couldn't pull them apart. Cameron and Merkel fell onto the sidewalk, uncertain where their friends were. When everyone sobered up, the guy that nobody wanted at the party was playing the piano and calling the tunes. This wasn't Waterloo, it was Brussels. I believe that by working together, we could have found an alternative candidate who supported, who commanded the support of every member state, agreeing together on the best way forward. That has been the practice the EU has followed on every single occasion until today. If there was a power shift, would you agree with that? I mean, do you think the role of the parliament has fundamentally changed in that process? As you know, I was not really in favor of this procedure. Personally, most of the leaders are highly involved in, the, in their parties, national parties and European parties, and they were part of the decision-making process within their party. So they didn't f felt it in as a power grab between the Parliament and the European Council. In what resembled a coup, the European Parliament orchestrated a shift in power which weakened the authority of member states and boosted the immediate and long-term power of the Parliament. Key to achieving this was the role of the socialist group, especially the German socialists and Matteo Renzi's Italian socialists. La questione della semplicità delle nostre istituzioni e della vita politica europea. Può sembrarvi strano che si utilizzi l'espressione semplicità, ma è una grande battaglia politica. As the cannon smoke lifts, Angela Merkel may look more like the loser in this power play. It was widely known that Merkel did not favor Juncker for the presidency. In the end, she was compelled for national political reasons to support Juncker. But Merkel was also compelled to surrender the practical authority of the Council to choose the President of the Commission, and though technically nothing has changed, a precedent has been set. Here at the European Commission, the President of the Commission sets out the general policy detail following the instructions which he receives from the Council. It's the Commission that sets out the laws, 
but Parliament will get to amend most of them. This might give the impression that the conflict is between the Commission and the Parliament, but actually a lot of the conflict takes place within the Commission itself. Within the Commission you have politicians from the left and from the right. So the power play starts in the nation states with the appointment of the Commissioner. It's a political game that starts long before the Commission is formed. This is the European Parliament in Brussels. Since the Treaty of Lisbon, the European Parliament has grown in authority and it continues to grow, but its powers are still limited. The Lisbon Treaty that entered into force in uh, December 2009 uh, made a great difference. I think that the Commission lost power and we won power. There isn't a lot of information um, about it. People don't really care, sadly. People are very confused when it comes to Europe. We have a very, very great lack of information for the citizens, I think. Whose responsibility is that information process? <laughs> I think there are many responsible people. First of all, we are not very numerous. Only 74 members of the European Parliament for France, which is very few. A national uh, deputy are more than, I think, 800. In France, we have a, a newspaper. The name is Canard Enchaîné, you know. And sometimes they say that, oh, there is a new law from the Commission for uh, one thing. It's, 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 she's in, in important this thing for French people. So you say, oh, the Commission is, uh, they are crazy in the Commission. So, and people think um, the Commission is more important than the Council of uh, Ministers. I think the medias have a great responsibility. They are not very interested in Europe. In the end, the battle for the control of Europe might look a lot more like Waterloo than many suppose, and it will be the rearguard actions of a small group of Prussians in Berlin which will have opened the path to victory. As always, politics is a local business. I was in London uh, just before the European Council, and I see what are the uh, expectancies from Great Britain. Some of them we can understand. If the idea is to have a, a simplified legislation, to have regulation which is understandable by the people, which is readable by the people, to have less bureaucracy, to have more politics and better policies, that we can answer, obviously, because it is of common interest. The Socialists didn't win the presidency of the Commission, but they did win the presidency of the Parliament. And the price of Renzi's support for Juncker is a relaxing of austerity economics. Angela Merkel was opposed to a loosening of austerity measures, so she's lost on this front too. In this context, leveraging Juncker into the Commission presidency looks like a hollow victory. Perché l'Europa fosse non soltanto un'espressione geografica, ma un'espressione dell'anima. Un bocca al lupo a tutti noi. Renzi's speech before Parliament as Italy assumed the rotating presidency could almost have been written for Cameron, and Cameron could have delivered almost all of it with ease. Not so Merkel. Renzi set out a spirit and policy sense which is at odds with Berlin's general direction. In the long term, Merkel's loss may be even greater. Allowing Parliament to determine the candidates for the Commission presidency means that if the Socialists win a majority in a future Parliament, they will not only control the Parliament, but they are likely to impose their will on the Commission too. The Member States will have effectively lost yet more sovereignty. Europe's power play has appeared to many watching small television screens as a full-on confrontation between two generals. But in the background, often unnoticed, there are legions and battalions supporting, reinforcing, attacking and pursuing. Within the European Commission, there is a power struggle between commissioners, another contest between commissioners and their secretariats. In fact, several key officials, especially the Secretary General, are often seen as more powerful than the Commission President. Influencing the Commission and the Parliament are lobby groups, national delegations, international organisations such as the United Nations and the IMF. And beyond these immediately visible political battalions are vested interests in the money markets. They may not lobby or discuss anything with the European executive, but they can change policy overnight. If, for instance, you divided the euro in two, and you had a northern euro and a southern euro, and the northern euro uh, uh, went through the roof and the southern euro declined, then suddenly it would be the most competitive uh, countries, particularly Germany, 
that would have a serious competitiveness problem. Players in the financial markets, whether they're hedge funds, private equity groups or sovereign wealth funds, all play a direct and indirect role on the European battlefield. It is certainly true that Cameron lost the fight to stop Juncker. He was outmaneuvered and not just by Angela Merkel, but two clear victories are emerging for Cameron. The first is his popularity in the United Kingdom. His do or die mentality was understood, respected and applauded by many voters, even if they didn't agree with his overall policy in Europe. The second victory is the clear shift to a reform agenda and ultimately this is what Cameron wanted. We are the full sum of our history and the measure of opportunity which lies ahead. If we did not take the road less traveled, we may do it yet. And if we take the wide road, it may lead to annihilation as surely as the narrow path leads to peace. It is not yet clear if Europe now stands at a crossroads. The dust is still settling. The propaganda of a fiercely fought campaign rings in our ears, a loud buzz not permitting us to think in soft colors. Thank you.